Hello and welcome to Chapter 7. Today we're going to start out by looking at Section 7.1, which deals with linear and nonlinear systems of equations. Now when we're looking at um, most application or real life uh, type problems, these problems are going to involve at least two, if not more, equations in two or more variables. Therefore, in order for us to find solutions of these equations, we need to solve a system of equations. Now, if you think back to Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 when we talked about solving systems of equations, um, remember that for a solution to be a solution, it has, it's going to generate an ordered pair, first of all, and that ordered pair has to satisfy each equation in that system. So just because that ordered pair might work for one equation, unless it works for all equations involved, it cannot be a solution to this system. Within Chapter 7, we are going to review um, different methods for solving systems of equations. In Section 7.1, we're going to look at the substitution and graphing methods. In 7.2, we're going to look at eliminations or combinations. And in 7.3, we're going to look at what we call the Gaussian elimination method. And I know you've talked about these, uh, like I said, in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, but just to kind of reiterate what the key points or key differences are, in 7.1, we're going to look at the method of substitution. Now, remember when you use substitution, our ultimate goal is to solve for one of the variables out of one equation. And remember, it doesn't matter if we're solving for x or y, um, as long as we go and we do the step 2, which is to substitute um, the variable we got from step 1 into our other equation, and it does have to be the other equation. Then we're going to solve for that new equation that we came up with here in step 2. Once we solve for that equation, then we're going to do what we call back substitute or plug in um, the value that we found here, and we're going to plug that into our original step 1 so that we can find the value of our other variable that we have yet um, to figure out. Then, as a final step, we should always double check our work to make sure that we didn't make any errors. And before we start doing an example, um, remember there's going to be three scenarios that we're going to run into when solving systems of equations. One, we can have what we call one point of intersection, and this would be a graphical representation. Um, if we solve these algebraically, we're going to get one coordinate point. Okay, and one point of intersection just means that there's one solution to that system. The second thing we could um, run into would be a case where we would have two intersection points, or more than one, I should say, and you would again be able to solve for these algebraically. This means we have two, sis or two solutions to this system of equations. And the third scenario would be where there are no points of intersection um, and you might run into something like this, or two parallel lines might um, or will generate no points of intersection as well. So let's start out by looking at example one. And example one tells us to solve by substitution. Now, again, just to kind of review, remember this right here means that we have a system. Here's one equation, here's the other equation. And if we're going to solve this by the method of substitution, typically you want to use one of the equations, if possible, that has a variable that's already isolated. Now, and if I look at my top equation here, both x and y, I would, be very, I would be able to isolate either one of those very easily because they have coefficients of 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by taking this top equation, and I'm going to get x by itself by saying that x equals y. And then wherever I have an x in my um, second equation, I'm going to go and plug in a y, and then I'm going to solve. So I really have 5 times x, which we just identified as the new y, minus 3 y equals 6. So now I'm going to um, solve for, in this case, y. So I'm going to combine my like terms. So I have 5y minus 3y, which is 2y equals 6, or y equals 3. So I just found one point, or one part of my coordinate point. 
then it says to take this and plug this value back into your first equation, and that's because you've already got x by itself. So by doing that, I'm going to pull this over here, I see that x equals 3. So I, this tells me that I have a solution point at the coordinate point 3, 3. So this right here, if I plug 3, 3 in, uh, up in both of these equations here, I get 3 minus 3 equals 0. So that's correct. 5 times 3 is 15, minus 3 times 3, which is 9. So 15 minus 9 equals 6, which makes that correct. So I just was able to double check my work. Now we can also double check our work by graphing this system. And if I graph, I get something that looks like this. And what you'll notice is we end up with a point of intersection right here at the coordinate point 3, 3. And again, if you don't have a graphing calculator at home, I was able to pull this graph up right here just by typing in graphing calculators on Google. And this, I think, was the first or second graphing calculator that popped up. So again, if you don't have a graphing calculator but you have internet access, you are able to graph. So now let's look at example two. This one tells us to also solve by substitution. In example two, when I look at my equations, I see that in equation, I have this variable and this variable right here both have coefficients of one. However, the top equation is a little more simplified. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get y by itself from that top equation. So if I have negative 2x plus y equals 5, and I get y by itself, I end up with y equals 2x plus 5. I'm going to take this right here and plug it in for every y into this equation here. So I end up with x squared plus 3x minus, and please put this in parentheses so that we do not forget to distribute our negative. So when I distribute my negative, we end up with x squared plus 3x minus 2x minus 5 equals 1. We'll collect our like terms. So x squared plus x I have minus 5, but if I bring this one over here and set it equal to 0, then I have minus 6 equals 0. And if I factor this, I have the factors x plus 3 and x minus 2 equals 0, which tells me then that x equals either a negative 3 or a positive 2. So I have two x values, and I'm going to write these as coordinate points up top. So I either have a negative 3 and another y value, or I have a 2 and another y value. And in order to find these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these right here and plug both x values into this equation to solve for y. So I have y equals 2 times a negative 3 plus 5, which gives me a negative 6 plus 5, or a negative 1. So I end up with the coordinate point negative 3, negative 1. And then if I plug in 2 for my other value, I have y equals 2 times 2 plus 5 which gives us 4 plus 5, or 9. So my other coordinate point is at 2, 9. Now if you plug both coordinate points into these two equations here, you'll see that you do end up with true scenarios, which tells you that both of these are solutions. And graphically, what you'll find is you have a solution point right here at a negative 3, negative 1, and a solution point here at the coordinate point 2, 9. So it confirms graphically as well. Now example 3 tells us to solve by substitution. 
And again, I'm going to take that top equation, get y by itself. So if we have 2x minus y equals a negative 3, I'm going to end up with y equals 2x plus 3. So now I'm going to take this, plug this in right here, and I end up with 2x squared plus 4x minus the quantity of 2x plus 3 squared. Well, if I square 2x plus 3, I really end up with 4x squared plus 2x times 3 is 6x times 2, which is 12x plus 9. So all of this here is really in parentheses. So this gives me 2x squared plus 4x, then I have to distribute that negative, so minus 4x squared minus 12x minus 9 equals 0. So when I collect my like terms, I have a negative 2x squared, then I have 4x and a negative 12, which is a negative 8x minus 9 equals 0. As far as factoring goes, the only thing I can do is I can factor out a negative, which gives me 2x squared plus 8x plus 9, and that quantity is equal to 0. So I'm going to have to go and do the quadratic formula. When I go and I do the quadratic formula, I end up with the opposite of b, which is a negative 8 plus or minus the square root of b squared, or 64 minus 4 times a, which is 2, times c, which is 9, divided by 2 times a, which is 2. So now I have x equals a negative 8 plus or minus the square root of, I end up with 4 times 2 is 8 times 9 is 72, so 64 minus 72 is a negative 8 divided by 4. Right now I run into an issue that I cannot take the square root of a negative number. So this tells me that I have no solution then. And to prove that graphically, let's look at our graph. You'll see that when we graph this, we have a linear line here. We have two nonlinear. It looks like these are on slant asymptotes. So in this case, then, we are able to confirm that there are no points of intersection. Therefore, there are no solutions to that system of equations. Now, example four is kind of a, an important equation, or an important example in chapter seven. Um, you will see questions like this on your test and your quizzes. Um, it's a pretty classic type of problem for uh, the section that we're on, but it says you invest $25,000 into two funds that pay 7% and 4% simple interest. You, in a you earn a total of $1,400 in your yearly interest, and you want to find out how much did you invest at each rate. So the first thing you typically have to do on equations like this, or problems like this, is to set up the system of equations. Now, generally, you have to figure out what you're ultimately trying to find. And in this case, you're trying to find out how much did you invest at a rate of 7% or X, and how much did you put in at 4% or your Y value. So if I write my equation, I'm pretty much always going to have an X plus a Y equals some total. Well, in this case, this total is the total amount of money that I've invested which is my $25,000. Then it tells me that I've earned a total of $1,400 in interest. Well, my interest is going to come by taking that total X and multiplying it by the 7%. Well, your 7% is shown as 0.07X, plus then you applied some money at 4% or 0.04Y, and this is going to equal your $1,400 or your money earned in interest. 
So now if I solve this system, and you can use substitution, you'll see how much money you um, were able to invest at 7% and how much you invested at 4% in order to earn that $25,000. So if you go ahead and solve, you'll see that you end up with $13,000. Five hundred at seven percent, and probably one of the most important things to and these problems too is to identify that x is really seven percent, your y is really equal to four percent. Okay, and then that means that we invested eleven thousand five hundred dollars at four percent. Now, if you are not able to come up with these numbers by using the substitution method please let me know in class and I'd be more than happy to work through each individual step of this example. Okay, and our final example for 7-1 is what we call a break-even point type of problem. And it just says that a company has an initial investment of $6,000 and one of your products has a unit cost of $23.20 and it has a selling price of $35.20 and it wants to know how many units must be sold in order to break even. Well, the one thing you have to know for break even, break even occurs when your cost equals your revenue, and revenue is the money that you have coming in. So when your cost equals your revenue, you're not making money, but you're no longer losing money either. So what we have to do is we have to first identify what our costs are, and our costs are going to come from the $6,000 investment. And this is probably like an equipment or something like that. Plus our $23.20. And that says that's our unit cost. So if I sell one unit, it's going to cost me $23.20. If I sell 10 units, it's going to cost me $232 and so on. So this is really going to be 23.2x. Then I have to come up with my revenue, or how much am I making for every unit that I sell. Well, we see that we're making $35.20 times X, because I don't know how many units I'm going to sell. So essentially, what our system looks like then, if we were to draw this as a system, is our cost equals 6000 plus 23.2X. And because we're relating this in terms of cost again, we could really say C equals 35.2x. And maybe it would be better to color C's Y's, but um, hopefully you get the point. So now in order to solve this system, what we're going to do is we're going to set both of these equations equal to one another. So we have 6,000 plus 23.2x equals 35.2x and when we go to solve for x we see that we have 500 units. So that tells me that we have to sell 500 units in order to break even which means again that we're not making money but we're also not losing money. Now if we wanted to know how much revenue was generated or how much cost has been put in when we sold 500 units, then we'd have to go and solve for the Y value. But at this point in time, we can go ahead and stop right here. And because, as I mentioned back on example 4, that that was such an important type of problem, I do want you to use your practice homework on a similar type problem, and it tells you that you have an inheritance of $12,000 that was invested among two funds, a money market fund that paid 5% annually, and a mutual funds account that paid 12% annually. The total interest that you earned during the first year was $1,120. I want you to just set up the system. You do not have to solve it, but I want you to set up the system that would tell us how to solve for the amount of money that was invested into each type of fund. And on that note, I hope you have a good night, and I will see you in class tomorrow.